Hey guys, I'm just about ready to upload the video, but I'd be remiss if I didn't talk about the current COVID outbreak happening in Vietnam. Many of my family members from home have told us about the mandated stay-at-home order, as well as the closing of virtually all businesses. Food prices have climbed up, and without their livelihoods, many people won't be able to support themselves or their family. I've left a link down below of a nonprofit that I personally donated to if anyone is interested and able to help out. It's going to be a really tough summer for a lot of people, so I would be so grateful if you could pitch in. Thank you. Often when learning about history in the States, we are presented with a narrative that supports Western superiority over the rest of the world. Outside of this bubble, however, other countries, for example, those in Asia, may view themselves as being on the rise and Western power in a state of decline. No one knows these narratives better than the sex workers in Vietnam, whose job it is to embody specific fantasies for their male clients. These fantasies change depending on the client's race, class, nationality, and the specific moment in history. In her book, Dealing with Desire, which is a culmination of five years of ethnographic fieldwork conducted in Vietnam from 2006 to 2010, Huang outlines three historical events within modern Viet history that track the rise of white prestige, the star of Asian power, and the clash that followed, all told with a focus on the sex industry. During the decades of French colonization, rapid urbanization created many bustling new cities. In the most populous one, Saigon, now called Ho Chi Minh City by Viet Nationals, a new sector of prostitution was established that specifically catered to French men. French military men were documented to pay sex workers more money than the average local Viet Minh. Later, during U.S. involvement in South Vietnam during the Vietnam War, American GIs replaced Frenchmen as the top paying clientele. It is this time period of white prestige that contemporary Western tourists hope to tap into when they step into a hostess bar in Vietnam to, as Huang puts it, reimagine the good old days of U.S. intervention. Sex work was banned during the years following the war by the Communist Party, otherwise known as the CPV. The CPV, despite winning the war, struggled to lift a war-torn country from poverty. So in 1986, the CPV passed a major economic reform called Doi Mai to revitalize the economy. Doi Mai opened the country up to two crucial income streams, tourism and foreign investments. There were two types of tourists. Male Western tourists look to affirm Western superiority by leveraging their U.S. currency to experience what they considered third world women for a bargain, but they weren't the highest paying clients. In 2006, that title went to Viet Kieu men, or Viet men who reside abroad. In contrast to Western tourists, these men, who were often discriminated against back in their country of residence, sought to contest Western superiority. Compared to stingy Western tourists, Vikio men might spend a lot of money on alcohol and women in hostess bars, which are luxury bars that employed hostesses to serve and flirt with male clients. Some hostesses will also engage in sex work, though not all. The third major player in the sex industry were Viet elites and their Asian business partners. Because many of Vietnam's assets were still controlled by the government, many Western investors, unsure of how to navigate new territories, hesitated to join in. Taiwanese investors, however, were able to access valuable government contracts with the help of local Viet elites. Building personal relationships then became key to securing foreign investment, and Viet businessmen looking to inspire confidence and foster close ties set business meetings within hostess bars to do just that. Then in 2008, the stock markets crashed and the social order flipped on its head. The United States and Europe bore significantly more financial turmoil than Vietnam. In fact, in 2008, Vietnam actually experienced a massive spike in foreign direct investment, not from Western powers, but from countries within the Asia-Pacific region. Huang writes that by 2010, capital from the six leading contributors in foreign investments to Vietnam were all countries within the Asia-Pacific region, giving an Asian face to wealth in Vietnam for the first time. This macro change contributed to the reframing of Vietnam's sex industry. For the first time, it wasn't white men or Viet Kieu who commended the most fiscal power with their U.S. dollars, but local Viet elites and their Asian business partners. 
Hostesses and sex workers adapted this narrative of Asian ascent and Western decline into their work in the years following the financial crisis. In my next video, I'm hoping to address the topic of consent and autonomy within the sex industry in Vietnam, as well as focus on the larger picture of violence against women in the country. Even with that, please know that I've left out a bunch of things from this book, which in and of itself only covers a very small part of Viet history. So this video is like a tiny slice of a tiny part in a very vast and nuanced narrative. If you're interested in learning more about the different niche markets that exist in Ho Chi Minh to cater to these types of men, the incredibly entrepreneurial women who run these businesses, and more about the male clients that frequent these bars, please check out Dealing in Desire by Kimberly K. Huang.